I really just want somebody who's going to aggressively fight for me in court. Is that too much to ask? Filing an eviction should not be complicated. There's got to be an easier way. Nothing frustrates me more than having to wait for my attorney to call me back. I need them now. What I really need from my law firm is someone who can provide my staff training so we actually can stay out of trouble. When you have property management problems, we have your solutions. This is the Zona Law Group podcast with the experienced attorneys from Zona Law. Hello, everybody. I'm Melissa Parham. I'm an attorney with Zona Law Group. I also represent uh, Manufactured Housing Communities of Arizona as their attorney and provide them with legal advice. Uh, the focus of uh, my practice at Zona Law Group is on manufactured housing communities and RV parks. And I have here with me today, Scott Blua from, my, from our firm as well, who will introduce himself. All right, thank you, Melissa. I'm an attorney with uh, Zona Law. Uh, I've been here for, uh, with Zona Law for about the last three or four years. Uh, I primarily focus on uh, assisting uh, Melissa with uh, handling of uh, any of the cases associated with uh, the manufactured home communities as well as uh, uh, RV communities as well. Uh, the focus of today's podcast is going to be on notices. What are the correct types of notices that should be sent? What are the different circumstances in which notices should be sent? Uh, it, and we'll also have to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what type of lease we're on because that will end up driving what type of notices uh, end up getting served. Uh, there's notices that are for non-payment of rent. There's for violations of the rules and regulations. And, of course, there's notices for um, criminal activity and health and safety. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, Probably one of the most common notices is non-payment of rent notices. So maybe we can start there and then kind of work our way to the more more complicated material. So unless you want to start with uh, non-pay, sure, sounds good. And I'll uh, I'll start with the uh, the mobile home parks, Arizona Mobile Home Parks Residential Landlord Tenant Act, uh, since those are probably the, the cases that I deal with the most. Um, so we'll talk about what types of notices you serve tenants uh, when the tenant owns their own mobile home and it's sitting on your space in the park. So we're dealing with a tenant owned mobile home in a mobile home park. Uh, so for non-payment of rent, the type of notice that the park would serve on that tenant uh, is a seven day uh, notice for non-payment of rent. And basically, the park would want to serve a seven day when the tenant has failed to pay the rent when the rent is due. Uh, for the due date, you'll have to check your rental agreement under most rental agreements that I draft and that I see the rent is due on the first. Um, now, the act does provide for a mandatory uh, grace period um, before late fees are, um, are introduced. And the late fees are limited to $5 a day. And it's uh, if the rent is not paid, I believe it's within six days of when due. So, but the rent is actually due on the first. So if the rent isn't paid on the first, technically the park could serve its seven day notice on the second if rent isn't paid on the first. Most parks that we deal with aren't quite that aggressive. Uh, most parks that we deal with will actually wait until after the grace period for late fees uh, to serve the seven day, but that's not required. Uh, the way that the seven day notice works is the landlord first has to properly serve it. So once the rent has not been paid for that month, the landlord has to serve the seven day notice. And for any notice that we're going to talk about today, there are really only two ways that the notice can be served. It can either be physically handed to the tenant, meaning that the tenant comes to the door and they take that notice from you. It's not putting the notice under the door. It's not taping it to the door. You have to physically hand it to the tenant. That's one method of service, personal service. The second is to send it certified. If the notice is sent via certified mail, it's deemed received under the law five days after mailing. So I'll, I'll have clients come back and say, well, I never got the notice back. I never got the green card back. Um, it just has to be sent certified, not return receipt. So you're not necessarily dealing with a green card. And then you'll wait seven days for the notice time and then add five days to that for mailing time before the property could take any further action on that notice. If the rent is not paid within that time frame, then after the seven days plus five, if the notice is sent certified, uh, then the park can go ahead and submit the it, to be filed as an eviction action for non-payment of rent. Um, Scott, do you want to get into whether parks can accept partial payments, whether they should accept partial payments really briefly? Because I see that come up a lot with uh, seven-day non-payment notices. Right. So uh, on the seven day payment uh, notices, uh, your most conservative bet, the, the way that you'll want to handle it is make sure that if you are going to accept a partial payment from a resident, make sure that you have them sign off on a document that says, well, yeah, we're going to accept this payment 
However, if you don't fulfill the rest of the payment obligations and whatever the, the arrangement is between the parties, then you're still retaining the right to move forward on an eviction. Now, under the Residential Act, if it's a five-day notice and it's a um, park-owned home, then that's a requirement. You must do those things. Otherwise, your case will get in immediately dismissed. Under the Mobile Home Parks Act, there isn't that specific provision. However, most judges look at it as a waiver of the right to move forward. Um, the, the same applies with if you've served any other notices as well. You'll have to reject the rent during that time period that there is a noncompliance uh, because, again, you'll, you don't want to give the impression that, oh, everything's okay. That's why I'm accepting your rent. So it, that's uh, that's critical, and uh, as you pointed out, Melissa, uh, it it does cost an extra couple bucks to have to send out a notice via certified mail. Uh, but because the act is very specific that it says the landlord is required to send it, there is no requirement, as odd as this sounds, for the tenant to have received it. So the most conservative bet is just send the notices certified mail, and that'll apply to any of the notices that uh, we, we talk about today. Uh, you lose. Right. And uh, one note on that, it, what, our thinking in our office is always more notice is good notice. Giving right. extra notice can never hurt you. It can only help you. And it can ensure that your tenant sees what's going on and is aware that, you know, you didn't receive their rent payment. Um, so to make valid service, again, either physically handed to tenant or send it certified. Um, but Scott mentioned it, it's deemed received five days after mailing, but we see all the time, a lot of tenants don't pick up their certified mail. Right. Uh, I think some tenants may think that, oh, if I don't pick it up, nothing bad can happen. Um, but make sure the tenant gets the notice. So send it certified, deemed received five days after mailing, but it doesn't hurt to send one first class regular U.S. mail as well. It doesn't count legally, but it just it helps to show that you're trying to give the tenant as much notice as possible. So more notice is always good notice. Right. And anytime that we're preparing notices on behalf of clients, generally we're, we're always sending it first class certified. Sometimes depending on the severity of the notice, we'll also send a process server in order to, to deliver it as well. Then that way, right. there's not going to be any questions by the court looking at you like, well, look, we understand that you have this ability to send the notices via certified mail, but if there's some possibility of being being able to spend the extra 50 cents that, and like Melissa said, it will only help you. Yep. So do you want to talk about uh, non-compliances, 1430s? Sure, sure. Let's talk about, uh, so uh, under the uh, Mobile Home Parks Act, uh, you do have the right to send a notice to a resident indicating that there are non-compliance. So what is a non-compliance? I guess that's the first place to start. Usually, and in most communities, you're going to have a set of rules and regulations. The rules and regulations outline the um, obligations and rights of the parties uh, to ensure that the community is kept to a certain standard. So if you have a rule and regulation that says that, uh, uh, you know, you have to take care of any weeds, that you have to paint on a periodic basis, that you can't have excessive clutter or other things stored on your space, that uh, the limits are only having uh, patio furniture and maybe a bicycle on the outside of the space, then it's your obligation as a manager to ensure that everybody is complying with that. You want to make sure that the community looks nice, that it's attractive for everybody that has to live there. And then, of course, that ends up increasing the value for the community as a whole. But occasionally you're going to run into circumstances where not everyone is complying with the rules and regulations. And that's, that's where these notices step, uh, start to take effect. So a 1430 notice gives a resident 14 days to cure an, any issue or a violation of the rules and regulations that period of time. If they don't fix it, then the after 30 days, they have to vacate the property. So the, most, the two most relevant time periods are the day that the notice is served and then once the notice has expired. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, kind of becomes confusing is that uh, the residents will sometimes look at that as like, well, then I have 30 days to fix it, not the 14 days. Well, the notices are very specific. You have the 14 days. It's one of two things has to happen. Either it gets fixed or you vacate within 30 days. If you don't do either one of those things, then you could potentially end up moving forward uh, with an eviction. Now, uh, what, as a practical matter, uh, it's, we discourage immediately going and using the 1430 notices. The biggest reason for that is that you're trying to establish some type of, you know, community where everybody is able to work with one another. So if you're able to reach out to uh, a resident and say, well, like you have some weeds or you have some excessive clutter, you have a courtesy notice or some other policy and procedure in place to start 
the non-compliance process, that's where you would want to start. And oftentimes the courts will look to see whether or not the manager has taken those steps. Now, it's not legally required. You don't have to serve a courtesy notice. There's nothing in the statutes that says that you have to do that. But just like sending a first-class uh, mailing of the notice uh, in addition to certified mail, more, the more notice that you give to people, the more opportunity that you give to cure, uh, oftentimes these residents, uh, that's their uh, a major asset of theirs, and you want to make sure that they are able to do everything that they can in order to maintain it. So then once you've uh, served the 1430, another thing that you'll need to remember is to take good evidence. Uh, it's frequent that we end up in a circumstance where the manager uh, it works on site, they're there every day, they see the condition every day, but then they don't find uh, document it uh, when these non-compliance uh, evictions end up getting sent over to our office. That's the first thing we look for. Do we have pictures or evidence to support it? Another common non-compliance is excessive guests. So if you have an excessive number of guests, well, who's to say what is excessive? Generally, we would look at you know whether or not neighbors nearby have complained about it, whether or not you have any video or audio recordings of that. The more evidence, the better. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to enforce the, those rules and regulations. Um, Melissa, well, so anything else uh, that you'd like to add with the 1430s? Uh, well, you mentioned earlier when we were talking about seven-day notices for non-payment. Uh, generally speaking, when you have a 1430 notice, uh, a non-compliance notice pending against a resident, uh, you want to be sure that during the term of that non-compliance notice, before it's been cured, that you don't accept the rent. Um, and this confuses residents a lot um, and upsets residents. Well, why, why are you refusing my rent? Why aren't you taking my rent? Um, the reason for that is that acceptance of rent when a violation is pending can be construed and courts may construe it as a waiver of that violation. So say you have a seven day notice outstanding and that's the only issue. Obviously, if the tenant comes in with all the money and they're there to pay the rent and they've got all the late fees, you have to accept that. So that you have to let them cure by paying. A 1430 notice, if they come in with all the money, but their skirting is still off their home or they still have unauthorized occupants living at the property, you don't want to accept that rent because acceptance of that rent may have the message to the tenant that, well, you know, everything's fine. We're accepting your rent. We'll just move on from that violation. So acceptance of rent when a violation is pending can constitute a waiver of that violation. Right. Um, and Scott mentioned any 1430 notice, we always have to have documentation and, and you really have to keep the time frames of the notice in mind. You need documentation before issuing the notice that uh, that the violation existed. After the 14 days are up, you need documentation showing the violation wasn't cured, if that's the case. And then we even like to see after the full 30. And keep in mind, that's 30 from the date of service. It's not an extra 30. It's 30 days from the date of service of the notice. Um, after that 30, we like to see documentation, if it hasn't been cured, that it still hasn't been cured. Uh, because sometimes if it is cured after the 30 and it's something like, you know, skirting that was damaged or the home needing to be painted, most reasonable landlords aren't going to want to still evict at that point. Um, but if it hasn't been cured after the 30, a judge is going to think, you know, you had a lot of time. You had the 14 days. You maybe even had the 30 days if the landlord was going to be kind and not uh, not move forward and you still haven't cured. So it's nice to have that documentation as well. But those cases are very evidence heavy. We have to be able to prove the noncompliance with photos, evidence, testimony from neighbors, depending on the violation. Um, but they're, they're very evidence heavy cases um, and easy to mess up. So you want to make sure you're, you've got all your ducks in a row in a noncompliance case. Right. And, and one of the issues that we also run into is that it's not always a bright line when it comes to a noncompliance because a noncompliance for a 1430 for a violation of the rules and regulations may also be a violation of health and safety, where it now runs into a different type of notice, which is a 1020. So for example, let's say, take the example of the excessive clutter and the excess, uh, excessive amounts of um, you know, items being stored on the mobile home space. So at what point, uh, in your opinion, does it go from being a 1430 to being a 1020? What do you think, Melissa? You know, those those cases are kind of tough. My general thinking is what I'll usually actually do is I'll, I'll look to the city ordinance in the in the municipality where the property is located. And if the, the property, the space has gotten to a condition where it clearly violates a city ordinance, so the park could get cited for that or the park has even been cited for it, then I think it, it moves into being a 1020. So if you've got examples 
examples of what usually violate city ordinances are things like broken windows, um, very tall weeds that are dried out, that are a fire hazard, um, so much stuff in the carport that it constitutes a fire hazard or just a blight in the community. Um, but it, it can be difficult. I'll see parks try to be aggressive and, and pursue a 1020 when it's really on the line. If it's something that's on the line where you're not quite sure it's a health and safety problem, then it's probably not a health and safety problem. Um, but if it's something that the, the city would cite you for or has warned they're going to cite you for, then then it's going to be a 1020 notice. And also a rule of thumb, anything involving sewage on the space is probably going to be a 1020 notice, maybe even an immediate. Um, so talk, 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 give us a call if you have that issue come up. Right. I, I think that uh, we've recently had a, a particular case where there was a piece of an awning that had like fallen over, been blown over by the wind. Now the, the pieces that have been blown over, there were these sharp edges on the awning that could have, if somebody had walked by and like touched it, then that, that could have ended up um, causing injury to them. So then in that circumstance, yes, it's a noncompliance having uh, under a 1430, but it, does it also fall as a 1020 as well? So that's uh, another thing that we have to consider is what is the impact on the community? If, uh, mm-hmm. You know, if there's tall weeds and a fire does start. And, you know, as we all know, these homes are sometimes close together, most uh, oftentimes close together. You don't want to create a circumstance where other people in the community are going to be put at risk. And that's why you'd want to escalate it to a 1020. Um, but there's also other circumstances that you may want to escalate even further. And then you end up falling into the immediate termination notice. The immediate termination notice is one of those ones where they cannot cure it, where something so severe and serious has happened that uh, now you cannot go back and fix it by any remedy. You have to vacate the property. Uh, what are some of the examples uh, for an immediate uh, termination? Yeah, so you're right. An immediate termination is for a material and irreparable violation. It's so bad that it can't be cured. Um, probably the most common examples we'll see is, is threatening to kill someone in the community. Um, and keep in mind, really, any any immediate case, generally speaking, it needs to be criminal conduct. That's what judges are expecting to see if you're thinking of pursuing an immediate. Um, so we've had cases where a resident has discharged a firearm in the community. We had one where he, the resident went out thinking there was a, a burglar nearby was, was his explanation, but he ended up shooting himself in the leg, which is terrible. But um, that occurred in the community. That's an immediate. I mean, discharging a firearm, especially recklessly like that. Um, threatening to harm the manager, threatening to harm neighbors, um, setting a fire in the community, criminal conduct, um, stealing something, stealing the neighbor's car, stealing the neighbor's golf cart. Um, those are all material and irreparable. It's really, it's conduct that's so bad that the fact that you discharge a firearm in the community, you don't get a chance uh, for, you know, 10 days to, to not shoot a firearm in the community. It's, so bad that the the tenant has to be removed. Um, And Scott, do you want to talk about how that notice works? Right. So when you end up serving an immediate termination, assuming that you end up getting personal service uh, on the resident, then we could the, the filing of the eviction could happen as soon as the next day. However, if you're required to send it via certified mail, then of course you have to add the five days. So then we have to have to wait the five days and then file shortly thereafter. Uh, another um, good thing to point out with immediates is, yes, it usually involves a criminal activity. What the courts are often looking for is what actions took place after the incident took place and what evidence do you have? The standard on an immediate is uh, by a preponderance of the evidence, whether or not it's more likely than not the incident happened. One of the number one defenses that uh, residents in these circumstances try to raise is that, well, I haven't been convicted of anything. I wasn't charged. The police didn't issue me a citation. Well, that doesn't mean that the incident didn't happen and then it didn't rise to the level of satisfying an immediate termination. One of those examples could be um, threats to a manager. So a manager feels threatened because of the words or actions of a resident. You know, they contact our office and they want to serve an immediate. One of the first questions that I'll usually ask is, were the police contacted? Did you feel so threatened and intimidated by the actions that you contacted the police immediate? If the answer is no, then we have to reevaluate whether or not that actually falls into a personal conduct violation under maybe a 1020 or a 1430 versus an immediate. Um, depending on the level of severity, oftentimes uh, we'll need to go and in t- obtain an injunction against harassment against the individuals that are causing that because we want to, of course, protect the safety of all of the agents and the representatives of the, the community because that's, uh, again, where all of these fall to, um, you know, making sure that we're protecting everyone. Um, 
the evidence also will come down to whether or not you can get other people nearby to testify about the incident. If there was a video of whatever incident that happened. Um, however, one of the roadblocks we run into is that a lot of nearby neighbors may not want to get involved. They may have seen the conduct that has happened, but they're hesitant because they're worried about retaliation. So what do you do? How do, how do you assuage the, uh, the worries of an individual who's worried about uh, retaliation? Melissa, what do you think? Uh, those those cases are, are very difficult um, because sometimes we have something that, that was very serious that occurred at the property. So obviously the, the person who caused that incident needs to be removed for the safety of, of the staff of the community and for other tenants. But understandably, other residents are, are scared to come to court. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we have to issue subpoenas and require them to come to court. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that most properties hate to have to subpoena their residents to court. It's not it's not good for customer relations, um, that's for sure. But sometimes what, what another tenant has done is, is so bad that it calls for action. And, and at least if the person is there pursuant to a subpoena, they can explain if, if they end up being confronted by the, the aggressor later, they can explain, I, I had no choice. I was required to go or else I could be held in contempt of court. Um, so that's, that's probably the primary method that we have to go, have to get witnesses there in court. Um, we'll also, if possible, we'll subpoena the, the police who responded. And sometimes um, that can solve some evidentiary issues, but sometimes we just have to have the witnesses present. Right. It, because uh... It's not enough to have the information that's taken down in a police report. A police report sometimes can be used as direct evidence if there's a crime-free, drug-free addendum where it includes a provision that allows for the police report to come in as direct evidence. But there's no opportunity for the other party to be able to question the police report about what happened. And often, in most circumstances, the police aren't there when they when the circumstances took place. They get called after the fact. So it really comes down to the nearby residents and oftentimes the, the residents themselves making statements that, uh, you know, may not assist them. Another circumstance that we often run into is the use of um, medical marijuana on property. Well, if you have a crime-free, drug-free addendum, it is still a violation under federal law to for the use of marijuana on property. So, uh, again, it comes down to evidence. And oftentimes residents in those circumstances will say, well, I have a medical marijuana card. Does that immunize you? Well, it doesn't because you signed the crime-free addendum saying that you cannot have that on property. Uh, another frequent cause for immediates are dog bites. Uh, we see that on a frequent basis. Somebody in the community has been injured or another animal or there's been property damage as a result of an animal getting loose. Well, that's another thing that the community needs to take a proactive stance towards. And sometimes if it's on the line, you know, our opinion is that we shouldn't be the ones and the on-site managers shouldn't be the ones making the decision about whether or not it's severe enough for to cause an eviction to happen. That's an issue that get, gets left to a judge to make the determination as to whether or not that behavior was severe enough. And while it may come with some cost associated with doing that, you know, having that protection for the community to say, well, look, we had a judicial determination about whether or not it was severe enough. It's not that we didn't take any action. We just left it up to the judge to make that decision. And sometimes that's the that's the best way to proceed with an idiot. Right. Yeah. The, the dog issue comes up a lot. And uh, we've. We really explained, uh, we try to explain to our clients that in, in that situation, when you have a dog that's attacked someone in the community or bit someone or behaved extremely aggressively, um, you really, like Scott's saying, you have to take action for insurance purposes, for liability purposes, in case if you ignore it and that dog ends up really violently harming someone down the road you're going to be liable at that point. Um, but what we do suggest to our clients is if it's possible, um, talk to the tenant about signing an agreement to, to remove the offending animal from the property before going the eviction route. And we, we resolve a lot of cases that way with a dog removal agreement um, instead of an eviction. But if you're going to go that route, make sure that the that it's documented that the dog is being removed because sometimes we'll see a client just take someone's word for, okay, I'll remove the dog. And a few months later, it's back and there was nothing in writing regarding the agreement to remove. So make sure that's that's documented. Right, right. Well, I think that's um, all the notices that uh, we're going to cover here. You got the 1430, you got the 1020, the non-payment of rent and the immediate notices. Anything else you can think of that we should cover here? Uh, we could talk about repeat conduct, but that's sort of getting into a whole nightmare. Maybe just the only advice I'll give on that is, is there is a process in the Mobile Home Parks Act 
um, for dealing with uh, residents who engage in repetitive noncompliance. So they keep violating the rules, but then they cure the violation each time they receive a notice. Um, there's two different processes for dealing with that, depending on whether it's the same violation or different violations. I really suggest contacting our office if you need help with that process, uh, because we'll, it involves a lot of notices. And at the trial, it involves, I mean, you've done these trials, Scott, on these repeat noncompliance cases. It involves a lot of proof. I think the trials we've done on those have gone maybe six hours in at least one case. I mean, it's, it's a lot of proof, a lot of evidence. Um, so contact your attorney's office, contact us if you need help with a, a tenant who's repeatedly violating the rules because it's, it's a drawn out process and you've got to do it right to, to have, have good results. Yes, it is extremely compl- uh, complicated to try to run through one of those uh, types of hearings. Uh, and imagine now that uh, repeat conduct, you have to prove the, that it happened on the date that you served the notice, that when it uh, was cured and that it was cured within the 14 days. So now compound that by now saying that you have to do that for several different notices over a potentially an expansive period of time. That's uh, it, it adds a level of complication, but uh, again, you know, contact our office and we'll, we'll be happy to walk you through that process. Yep. All right. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you.